listening to Conversations with Shonda, a podcast and event series hosted by Shonda Smith-Baker. Today's guest is Richard Rothstein, a historian, academic, and author of The Color of Law, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. Enjoy the show. What an amazing time that we're in. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm so concerned about uh, a lot of things and um, really pleased to talk with you. Um, I got your, I can't remember who recommended uh, The Color of Law for me to read. And I, re- I was reading it on an airplane and I was just captivated. And there was moments where I was infuriated and then there was moments that I was tearful. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then I got to a moment of like, I'm reading a policy book and I'm emotional. <laughs> <laughs> like what is happening right now to me? Um, well, actually, this is a big challenge I'm facing now because, um, you know, actually the, the book that you are reading is a history book. Mm. And it's easy to write a history book for a general audience because you just tell stories. But I'm trying now to begin work on a sequel, which would, would be a policy book of what we do about it. And I'm having a great deal of difficulty figuring out how you write a policy book for a general audience. So that's my struggle right now. Interesting. And so you see that as kind of the next project for you is, have you been getting feedback on, you know, so, so, so that was what has happened and that is what's happening, but where do we go from there? Well, that's right. Every, I've been, um, nonstop running around the country, giving lectures about this and of course some, the writing I've been doing and the reaction I get from everybody is, uh, what can we do about it? Sure. And uh, so what I've been do, I, I've actually done is I've um, gotten together a group of uh, national civil rights leaders, and we've created something or are creating something called a national committee to redress segregation. Mm. And it will be uh, the national is misleading. It's not going to be focused on national policy because uh, my view and I think all of our views is that there's no political support for national policy at this point. Nor would there be in a democratic administration, which is another point. Um, mm. uh, so what we're focused on doing is creating local civil rights groups in local communities to take steps to redress segregation, and that's what I'm trying to do. The book I'm trying to write would be a manual for these local civil rights groups. Yeah, and um, I was watching uh, one of your uh, speaking videos, and you talked about housing as being one of the uh, issues that the civil rights movement did not address and focus on. And when I think historically of the NAACPs and in the urban leagues and and such, and maybe even the the black churches specifically, uh, but what you're suggesting in your next work and an establishment of an infrastructure, right, to move this work forward, is that there's not an infrastructure uh, currently um, in our states? There are many, many groups that are focused on affordable housing. Mm -hmm. But affordable housing and non-segregated housing are not the same thing. In fact, Uh, most of the affordable housing that we produce, and we don't produce anywhere near what we need, is placed in already low-income minority neighborhoods reinforcing their segregation. Sure. Uh, Because it's easier. Yeah. Well, of course, right? So we have NIMBY, not in my backyard. That's right. That's right. Well, what I said, the reason I said before is that we wouldn't have political support even in the Democratic administration to do anything about this at this point until we create a a mass movement about it, is that the Democratic Party today is a coalition of minority and suburban voters. And the suburban, liberal, well-educated voters are the biggest obstacle Mm. to redressing segregation. Uh, You call them NIMBYs. uh, And and the less... So when when we create uh, these local committees, these local civil rights committees, one of the places we're going to have to start is in suburban communities. Well, I was just going to say, there are are people in these communities who are active. They're a tiny minority, but we'd have to start with them. Organize uh, committees. uh, Liberal churches might be a place to start. Uh, You know, as I say, I've gone around the country giving lectures. I've I've given 
talks about this in these kinds of suburban, all white, exclusive communities. And um, there's an appetite among a tiny minority to redress the segregation that uh, their communities have historically created. But they're nowhere near powerful enough to affect change. And that's what we have to organize. Mm -hmm. And do you think that um, part of the reason that um, they are not equipped to move is because they don't adequately understand um, both the history and the role that they are um, actively playing to keeping it as it is? Yes, I think that's right. I think that nobody understands this. Well, not nobody. Uh, uh, I, my book has had a big impact. I, I know and other people have been writing about this recently as well, but nobody really understands this history. I said that the reaction I get is what we can do about it. That's the second reaction. The first reaction I get from people is how come I didn't know about this? You know, I, I, I uh, didn't learn this in high school. I didn't learn this in college. And uh, everybody, black and white, have uh, adopted this narrative of de facto segregation. As though something had happened for economic reasons or because of private bigotry, self-choices, non-understanding that the residential segregation that we have in this country is as much a civil rights violation, it's as unconstitutional as created by government, is the segregation of you know, buses or water fountains or schools or any of the things we, we addressed in the mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I would encourage uh, anyone listening to go out and uh, read, read your book, The Color of Law. Can you provide us maybe a a snapshot or a summary of um, what that book details um, for folks that may not understand um, our government's role in creating uh, what is. Yes, certainly. Uh, every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. There are clearly defined areas that are either all white or mostly white. Clearly defined areas that are either all black or mostly black. The narrative that we have all adopted the reason that we haven't done, felt any obligation to do anything about this is we've told ourselves that this all happened naturally, by accident. It happened because of private bigotry or homeowners or landlords wouldn't rent to African Americans in white neighborhoods or actors in the private economy, banks, real estate agents, not government, discriminated in how they carried out their private economic activities or maybe because people prefer to live with each other of the same race. Or maybe it's just an economic result because so many African Americans can't afford to move to white middle class neighborhoods. And we give a name to this rationalization. So we, we say it's de facto segregation. And what my book, The Color of Law, does is shows that the de facto segregation story is false. It's not based on historical fact. It's a rationalization we've created to excuse ourselves from addressing the fact that we're an apartheid society. And if we understood that this segregation was created by government, we would understand that we have an obligation under the Constitution to remedy it because it's a civil rights violation. So it's not just civil rights violation, it's the civil rights violations that we corrected in the 20th century. Now, the policies that were followed were numerous in the 20th century to create segregation, racial segregation, and they were so powerful that they still determine the racial boundaries that we have today. For example, the suburbanization of this country, which did not exist before the mid-20th century, it's a post-World War II phenomenon. The suburbanization of this country was engineered for whites only by the federal government through a policy to move all white working class families who are living in urban areas out of those cities into single family homes in the suburbs. This was an explicit racial policy. Uh, no developer could have built the kinds of suburbs that were created in the mid 20th century on, their, on his or her own. It was not possible, not financially possible. No bank would be crazy enough to lend a developer the money to build 10, 15,000 homes in one place, which he had no buyers and no prospect of buyers. The only way that these developers, and perhaps the most famous of them is Levittown, East of New York City, but they're in every metropolitan area in this country, 
the only way that developers like Levitt could have built this community of 17,000 homes was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, submitting his plans for the development, the um, architectural design of the homes, the construction materials he was going to use, and a commitment never to sell a home to an African American. Uh, the Federal Housing Administration even required Levitt and these other developers to place a clause in the deed of every home, prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. And with that racial exclusion guarantee, the federal government then would guarantee Levitt's and these other developers bank loans to go ahead and build the development. The result is that the families, and these were mostly white, working class, returning war veterans from World War II families, were able to buy these homes very inexpensively. They were nine, ten thousand dollar homes. Today's money, it's about a hundred thousand dollars. Those homes today in these suburbs all across the country no longer sell for a hundred thousand dollars. They sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, in some places even a million dollars or more. Uh, the white families who bought those homes over the next couple of generations gained wealth from the appreciation and the value of their homes. They used that wealth to send their children to college. They used it to finance emergencies if they had any temporary unemployment. If you have wealth, you can um, weather temporary unemployment. If you don't and you're unemployed, you get pushed further down the socioeconomic ladder. Uh, they use it to bequeath wealth to their children, who then had down payments for their own homes. The result of this policy is that African American wealth is now only about 7% of white wealth, family wealth. African American incomes are 60% of whites. So it's not that they're equal in incomes, but that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 7% wealth ratio, which persists today is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid 20th century and has never been remedied. And that we as Americans have never accepted the responsibility to remedy because we haven't understood it. It was a constitutional violation. So that in, in the book, uh, I go through many of these policies, not only the FHA subsidy, subsidies to suburbanization, there were many policies at the federal, state and local levels that were explicitly designed to ensure that blacks and whites could not be with one another in any metropolitan area in the country. We have, as I said, an apartheid system, an unconstitutional system of residential boundaries. And we have an obligation, if we take our responsibilities as citizens seriously, to remedy it. So as the uh, suburban neighborhoods were being uh, developed, is this also in the 20th century where there was also what we have defined historically as the ghetto was also emerging or what is kind of the history of the low income communities that have been defined as ghettos? Well, when the federal government subsidized whites only to move out of urban areas into these suburbs, African Americans were left in urban areas to they were rarely able to get mortgages for homes in urban areas. The result is that they had to double, triple up with relatives in order to be able to buy a home. The communities became overcrowded. Frequently, the only way they could buy the homes was from speculators who sold them homes on contract, which is really just a rent to own system. And if they fell behind in a payment, the speculator could seize the home. Uh, without any equity being um, left for the for the homeowner. So when you crowded African Americans into urban areas, uh, you created slum conditions. We refer to it uh, as a ghetto. These were two comparable or, or complementary policies, moving whites into single-family homes in the suburbs, concentrating African Americans in urban areas. As you may know, in the 1930s, the uh, federal government drew maps of every metropolitan area, every large metropolitan area in the country, coloring red the areas where African Americans in particular lived, indicating that these areas were too risky 
for federal guarantees, for example, FHA mortgages or VA mortgages, so very few were issued to African Americans. African Americans wound up having to pay more for their housing, which was less adequate housing in ghetto areas than whites were paying comparable housing elsewhere. You know, I often say this and think this, um, that often when we're talking about disparities, I do think that from a lack of understanding of historical context and policy, we may minimize those to a set of decisions that a family is making or an individual is making or making. What can you walk through some of the rippling effect of, of these housing policies? And do you think that that history and that connection explains some of the disparities that we're experiencing today? Well, it explains most of the disparities. Segregation is the underlying cause of so much of the inequality that we have in this country. I mentioned just a minute ago the wealth gap mm -hmm. that was created by its explicit federal policy to segregate blacks from whites. Uh, wealth is underlies uh, most of families' ability to prosper, to be upwardly mobile. Uh, as I mentioned before, it, it uh, determines uh, frequently the ability to go to college. It uh, is used to subsidize retirements. It's an enormous cause of inequality, the, the wealth gap. But there are other, other consequences of segregation as well. We spend a lot of time talking about the achievement gap in schools. The achievement gap is primarily responsible. Is primarily, excuse me, the achievement gap is primarily attributable to the fact that we concentrate the most disadvantaged young children in single schools without adequate resources and where the children come to school with serious social and economic disadvantages that reinforce each other and make it impossible for them to achieve at the same level as um, white middle-class children. I used to be a newspaper columnist, as you may know. I, I remember writing a column once about asthma. Mm -hmm. African-American children in urban areas have asthma at four times the rate of middle-class children. They have four times the rate because they're living in more polluted neighborhoods with more deteriorating buildings, more dust in the environment, more diesel trucks driving through their neighborhoods. If a child has asthma, that child is more likely than children without asthma to be up at night freezing, coming to school sleepless or drowsy the next day. That sleeplessness or drowsiness predicts lower average achievement to a tiny bit. But when you add it up with all the other conditions like that, that also predict lower achievement, not just asthma, but lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity. All of those add up to explain most of the achievement gaps. So the achievement gap is, is primarily, not entirely, but primarily the result of racial segregation. Mm -hmm. Health disparities between African Americans and whites, as we know. Uh, African Americans have shorter life expectancies, they have greater rates of cardiovascular disease. A good share of the responsibility for that is they're being concentrated, so many of them, not all, but so many of them, being concentrated in less healthy neighborhoods, uh, less access to healthy foods, exposed to all of the causes of pollution that I mentioned a minute ago. So racial segregation, residential segregation is a cause of the achievement of, of the health disparities as well. We spend a lot of time and energy focused, and we should be focused on mass incarceration. So many young African-American men are uh, disparately incarcerated. That couldn't happen if we weren't concentrating the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods where they had less access to jobs or even the transportation to get to those jobs. And I'd say another cause, another result, rather, another result of the residential segregation that we have unconstitutionally created and we're paying a big price for now is the very, very dangerous, frightening, really, political polarization that exists in this country today, mm -hmm. which not entirely, but largely tracks racial lines. I mean, how can we ever develop the uh, common national identity that we need to preserve this democracy? So many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that they have no ability to identify with each other, to empathize with each other, to understand each other's life experiences. So 
I conclude that residential racial segregation is the single biggest social problem that we face in this country. And unless we address this, we're not going to be able to address any of the consequences in schools, in health, in criminal justice uh, that we suffer from today. Sure. And, you know, you talk um, about the, the racially segregated schools, and this may be a bit of a segue, but I did think it when uh, I was listening, is that um, I've often wondered, um, our K-12 system seems to be so impacted by all the things that you just mentioned, yet our historically Black colleges and universities um, are so successful with the same uh, population. How do you how do you explain that? Well, Every, every human population has a distribution of uh, outcomes. It, it, when we talk about the differences between whites and blacks, we're not talking about every white and every black being identically uh, different. Mm -hmm. And so there's a distribution in the African-American population. There's a distribution in the white population. The most highly motivated African-American children can succeed. But the proportion of those who succeed is smaller than the proportion who succeeds in the white population. So it's not surprising that uh, African American children who are who go to college, and many of them go to historically black colleges and universities, that they succeed. But uh, in their, their proportions are not as great by a far measure than the proportions of whites who are able to succeed as a result of a college education. Well, I was just gonna say that, so you have, uh, there's the racially racial segregation, and then there, um, it feels like laid over that is class and, and wealth segregation perhaps. And so is it also having uh, financially segregated communities um, that well, is impacting this, or is it, is it, is it really based on race? The well, policies were based on race, yeah? Of course, the, you know, we have disadvantaged white families as well, white children as well. White low-income children are much less likely to live in a neighborhood where other children are low-income than black low-income children are. Mm -hmm. And so the, for reasons I described before, black children are more likely to be low income because of segregation than whites are. It's not that no children would be, no black children would be low income if they weren't segregated. There are white children who are low income, but the share of them who are low income is uh, by many times greater than the share of white children who are low income because of segregation. Can you talk a little bit, um, I think I, I read or heard you talk about social psychology policies that have shaped the social structure, uh, sectors or the social structure, structures in this country. Can you say more about that? Well, um, I don't know exactly what you're referring to, but maybe it's this. There's no doubt that um, white bigotry, the result of our failure ever to confront the legacies of slavery, our stereotypes of African Americans was responsible for creating political conditions in which the government unconstitutionally pursued these policies of segregation. So I'm not minimizing the, the role of, of white bigotry, mm -hmm. but segregation itself creates stereotypes that reinforce the bigotry. So when we concentrated, as we did and still do, the lowest income African Americans in overcrowded neighborhoods with less access to services, less access to good jobs. Uh, the, their neighborhoods become slums. They're overcrowded. Uh, they, uh, because they're overcrowded, more of their social life goes on in the streets, uh, for example. Uh, whites look at these neighborhoods. And by the way, there are also many of these neighborhoods have were deprived of adequate public services, garbage collection, sewers, sidewalks. Whites look at these neighborhoods and uh, conclude that uh, they're slums, which they are, and further conclude that African Americans must be slum dwellers, and therefore the whites don't want the African Americans moving into their neighborhoods because 
they think then their neighborhoods will become slums. So that the, the psychology, the stereotypes that are created by segregation reinforce existing stereotypes in a negative direction. Whites who look at these neighborhoods don't realize that it was government policy to create these slum conditions, not the behaviors of the African Americans themselves. And it happens in the opposite direction as well. Uh, as, as you may know, when you write a book like mine, or, you know, The Color of Law came out in hardback in 2017, and the paperback came out a, a year later. And so in that year, I got a lot of correspondence and reaction from people who read the hardcover book. I wrote in the paperback, in a section that was added to the end of the paperback edition, about a letter I got from a young African-American man in New Orleans who said he grew up uh, in a low-income black neighborhood in New Orleans. He looked around and saw that the whites were living in more affluent neighborhoods. He figured that was a natural phenomenon. That's the way things work. And he said, if he had read, and then he read my book. And he said, if he had read that book when he was younger, he would have tried harder in high school mm. because he would have realized that this was not, that failure was not an inherent characteristic of his, but something that was created by government and that he could try to overcome. Well, social psychologists call that stereotype threat that uh, African Americans themselves come to accept the stereotypes that are created by their conditions if they don't understand the causes of those conditions. So both the stereotypes that whites have of African Americans and the stereotypes that African Americans have of themselves and of whites are the product of, of these policies of segregation. How did you come to study this? What was well, that path for you? Well, the path for me was I was a an education columnist and writer. I uh, was for many years was writing about education policy. I came to understand uh, as a result of my study of education policy that the biggest problem that we face in American public education today is the segregation of students, as I mentioned before. Um, that segregation, I came to understand, was the result of the fact that the schools in which they're and the neighborhoods in which their schools were located were segregated. So I came to believe that neighborhood segregation was an educational problem, as I described. And I began to look into neighborhood segregation more deeply, really only as a, a way of addressing the achievement gap in schools. And the more I got into it, the more I learned about uh, the fact that the de facto segregation was a myth. And then I began to study it more deeply, and the more I studied it, the more different policies of federal, state, and local governments uh, were uncovered that uh, created the um, segregation that we know today. So for me, the path was through educational policy. Were, as you um, dug into that research, were you shocked by what you learned and uncovered? Yes, I was. Um, I was uh, surprised. I knew a little bit about this, uh, and it's not that uh, nobody writes a book without having an idea that they're going to come up with something when they do the research. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I had no idea about it. But I didn't, I, I, as a very, very young man, I had worked uh, as a research assistant for the Chicago Urban League on a uh, lawsuit that uh, had been filed in Chicago about the fact that the Chicago City Council uh, and the Chicago Housing Authority had deliberately created public housing projects for African Americans in black neighborhoods and public housing projects for whites in white neighborhoods. So that was in the back of my mind. I knew there was some of this. I had no idea that the uh, policies were so numerous, so systematic, so interrelated to create an unconstitutional system. So I was shocked about it as uh, I uncovered more and more of it. Um, but it also, and, and uh, I, I have to say this, uh, the more I studied this, the more hopeful I became. Because so long as we believe it all happened by accident, it's natural to think it can only unhappen by accident. Mm -hmm. Once we understand that this was all created by policy, the segregation of this country is a conscious, deliberate creation of unconstitutional policy. 
we can understand that policy can also undo it. And I think that having this understanding of the history creates the opportunity to make a kind of progress that we couldn't make so long as we were blinded by the de facto myth. So while I was shocked, the more I learned about it, the more hopeful I became that it can be undone. And are there any um, cities or examples um, in our country um, that are doing innovative work to help untangle this complicated housing history? Yes, there are many, many examples of, of places that are taking small steps, but they're all small. And they're not nearly what's necessary to make a serious dent in the problem. But there are many local programs that are well intentioned. For example, the as you know, we have a, a program subsidized of developers, a federal program to build housing for low income families who are disproportionately African American and minority. It's called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Mm -hmm. Typically, developments for those minority families are placed in already low income segregated neighborhoods, but there are some cities who are making serious efforts to try to get them placed in higher opportunity neighborhoods. And Dallas is one, uh, uh, there, there, there are others as well. There's also a program um, for low income African Americans that um, uh, called the Section 8 voucher program, with which you're probably familiar. It's a subsidy to families to rent apartments. It reinforces segregation because most Section 8 vouchers are usable only in low income communities. But there are some cities that are taking big steps to try to uh, tilt the use of Section 8 vouchers toward higher opportunity communities. Of course, the big obstacle to that is that there are so many high opportunity communities whose zoning laws prohibit the kinds of uh, multi-unit developments that Section 8 vouchers could be used in. But where they exist, the Baltimore would be an example that does a very good job of trying to um, use those uh, vouchers in higher opportunity neighborhoods. Seattle is another one that has an experiment along those lines, a very successful one. Mm -hmm. At the, that's for um, the low income families. For higher income families, uh, middle income families, there are programs that provide down payment assistance. The families that could easily make payments, uh, mortgage payments on a single family home but who don't have the down payment to be able to get into it in the first place, largely because of that wealth gap that we've created before. So there are many communities in the country who are beginning to create down payment assistance programs from families like that. There are some places, and you know this better than I do, that having understood this history have taken small steps towards opening up white neighborhoods to uh, minority families. So in Minneapolis, as I'm sure you know, you abolish single family zoning mm -hmm. throughout the city, understanding that the single family zoning reinforces racial segregation. Now that's only a very small first step. The abolishing single family zoning alone is not going to ensure racial desegregation because unless you have inclusionary requirements as well, it's likely that the, the additional uh, two-family and three-family units that would be built would be occupied primarily by people who can pay market rates for those units. But it's a step in the right direction. And mm -hmm. there are other places that take, Portland, Oregon has taken a similar step. Uh, it's being debated very furiously in the, in the state of California. There are a, uh, two years in a row now, a bill to uh, abolish single-family zoning in high opportunity communities has been defeated in the state legislature, but the very fact that it's being debated is a big step forward. So there are all small steps being taken, uh, but we need much, much more if we're going to make a serious dent in this segregation that we've created. Yeah, and and so you mentioned um, one of the policies in, in opportunity neighborhoods and, and the zoning restrictions. If we do nothing, right, if we just move forward, and even with some of the things that you just mentioned, could this book be written in 20 years from now, uh, reporting the policies right now that are creating the same conditions that you've written about? 
Well, certainly, if we do nothing, nothing's going to change. But uh, yeah, let me say this. We are now, in this country, having a more accurate, passionate discussion about the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow than we've ever had in American history. And I say that seriously. Ever before in American history, we've never had a truth and reconciliation process. We don't have a formal one now. But there's a great amount of discussion about slavery. We have uh, white elected southern politicians running around removing statues that commemorate the defenders of slavery. We have uh, many books on uh, the subject. Uh, mine has gotten enormous attention, but the Michelle Alexander's book about uh, mass incarceration, or uh, Brian Stevenson's book about the uh, uh, death penalty. So there are many, uh, uh, Matthew Desmond's book, about evictions. Mm -hmm. All of this discussion is going on now, and I believe that it's possible that uh, a new civil rights movement can emerge from this discussion that's going to make a serious dent in the problems of segregation. I'm not suggesting it's going to be easy, but I think the conditions for it are riper now uh, than they have been in the past. So you talked about truth and reconciliation. Do you have any comment about reparations? Well, I don't, personally, I don't use the term reparations because most people hear the term reparations and they think of a single monetary payment to the current generation. And that payment would never be very large and it wouldn't solve the problem. This is a multi-generational problem. We need much more than that. We need policies some of which would be cost-free uh, and are not covered by reparations. Some of them would be costly. For example, what we should be doing is we should be subsidizing heavily the purchase of homes in middle-class suburban communities by African Americans who cannot presently afford them, but who could have afforded them when those homes were uh, sold to whites only. That would be a costly program. But other programs would be no cost. For example, if we um, enacted a policy that required that more of the low-income housing tax credit developments be placed in high-opportunity communities, if we prohibited single-family zoning nationwide, those kinds of things don't cost anything, but um, would be big steps towards desegregating the society. So some of the policies we need to follow would be costly, Others would be at no cost. Restricting ourselves to a single monetary payment to African Americans as a way of solving this problem would not accomplish anything. And, well, I'm, I'm not saying it won't accomplish anything. Of course, it would accomplish whatever the payment was. But once we've done that, many people would say, okay, we've solved that problem now. Let's move on. And the um, impetus to enact it the many, many policies that we need on an ongoing basis, not just this year, but next year, and 10, and 20, and 30 years from now, uh, the motivation for those would be, be weakened. So I think uh, focusing on reparations is a mistake. Certainly, we do need to spend a lot of money to undo the segregation that we've created, but we can't do it with a token payment to African Americans. When you were doing your research, did um, any of, of that um, bring you to the history of redlining in, in Minnesota or Minneapolis? Well, my book and the research I did was a, uh, a national story. Mm -hmm. And it was it's duplicated in every metropolitan area in the country. Um, I, uh, I didn't focus specifically on, on Minnesota, but it certainly exists in Minnesota as well. As you probably know, there's a group working partly out of the University of Minnesota that has been identifying all of the deeds in the city of Minnesota, in the city of Minneapolis, that uh, restrict homes to Caucasians only, uh, and that's systematic throughout the city of Minneapolis, as it is in many many cities across the country. So I don't specifically focus on Minneapolis or Minnesota. But the policies that I've been describing to you were consistent throughout the country. They were national policies, not local policies, or they were local policies and supplemented them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Mapping uh, Prejudice Project, I think, is what you're mentioning. And yes. 
Um, we recently actually showcased uh, the documentary, The Jim Crow of the North, um, locally, which um, does dive into a, a bit of the local history. One of the, one of the things that I don't know if I was shocked about, but uh, definitely impacted me was the history of the freeways in our country. Mm -hmm. And locally, we talk about um, 35W and we talk about the freeway that came through the Rondo neighborhood, both black neighborhoods that separated um, the white community, the black community, and just the devastation that happened from that. When I, I, I don't think I completely understood. And if I understood, I did not um, sit with it. It did not resonate um, to the extent it did when I read your book in terms of what happened and that it was so organized and so consistent. Can you share just a little bit? Because I do think that uh, for listeners that are local, they will understand that piece because there's been so many uh, conversations around that. Well, I can certainly talk about it generally. I don't know specifically about Minneapolis, okay. but I do know that in the 1950s, when the freeways were first uh, created, the, the national highway system was first created, and the state highways, highway spurs going into cities were deliberately routed, either to create boundaries between black and white neighborhoods, or to demolish black neighborhoods that planners wanted to move farther away from where whites were working and living. One that I'm familiar with, as I say, I don't know Minneapolis specifically, but uh, I lived in Chicago, as I mentioned before, but the Dan Ryan Expressway that goes through the south side of Chicago is a boundary designed to separate black and white neighborhoods. In my book, uh, I describe, I focus uh, on uh, Miami, where the uh, highway, the interstate highway that goes through Miami was deliberately routed to uh, move African Americans out of a neighborhood near downtown into a farther distant ghetto where they had left, had less opportunity and less access to jobs, transportation, and uh, resources in their community. This was an explicit racial policy. Mayors and city planners were um, quite open about their purpose in routing highways in this way. I mentioned earlier the Federal Housing Administration that um, subsidized the suburbanization of this country. The Federal Housing Administration put out a manual. And the manual, in addition to saying that no federal bank guarantees could be given to uh, subdivisions that would be integrated, uh, it, that manual also said that highways would be a good way to separate black from white communities. This was an explicit racial policy of the federal government. I just, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I mean, I know it. every time I hear it, it just hits my heart um, in the deepest, the deepest way. Well, and if, I, if I can say so, what you should say is, this is an unconstitutional system, and as American citizens, we need to do something about it. And that's what I'm hoping people will say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, as we get ready to close, I, I think that is, like, you know, what are individuals and institutions, and specifically, what can, is there any role that philanthropy can have? in terms of elevating this issue? Because I think it's one thing for us to, I actually don't even want to qualify that. You know, what do you think philanthropy's role is in addressing uh, this? Well, I think, as I said, there's no political support now, yet, for redressing segregation on a massive scale. As I mentioned, uh, I am hoping to see, and I'm trying to the extent I can to spur the creation of local civil rights groups that can uh, take action in their local communities to redress segregation. But I can give you an example. I was uh, giving a talk in uh, Kansas City a couple of weeks ago, and I was moderating a panel with the mayor of, of uh, Kansas City. And we were talking about the fact that most of the low-income housing is being built is being placed in low-income neighborhoods in Kansas City. And, reinforcing its segregation. And so I asked him, why don't you abolish single family zoning in the city of Kansas City so that we can begin to place some of these projects in um, high opportunity places where people have access to jobs and transportation and good schools and healthy food and healthy air. And he said, well, there's no support on the city council for that. So I asked him, well, how many city council people do you think would support it? 
And he thought for a minute, and he said, four or maybe five. And then I asked him, how big is the city council? And he said, 13. And so I said, so you really need two more if you can get that fit. And he said, that's true. So I asked him, which are the two city council districts do you think would be most likely to be subject to a change of view on this? And he thought for a minute, and he named districts four and district six. I know nothing about Kansas City, but that's what he said. And I was speaking before an audience of 300 people in Kansas City. So I asked the audience, how many of you live in District 4 and District 6? And um, I'd say 40 names, hands went up. Mm -hmm. Well, a civil rights group in Kansas City should begin by organizing those 40 people to begin educating their local communities about this history of segregation, leading to a campaign to press those two city council people to. Um, redress segregation by abolishing single family zoning in the city. Uh, what can philanthropy do? Well, that committee is going to need some support. Mm -hmm. And what philanthropies today do is they look for projects to support that have measurable results, frequently quantifiable. They don't, this is not the kind of thing that philanthropy typically supports is, is direct action with civil rights groups. It's very hard for these groups when they do exist to raise money for that kind of thing. So I think philanthropy uh, needs to spend some time reconsidering whether it's uh, the kinds of projects it focuses on, which are all valuable and not, and not diminishing them, are the only kinds of things that they should focus on, and whether focusing on a civil rights movement uh, at a local level in local communities could be a place where attention could be devoted. I would love to talk to you more about that as we're thinking through our own civil rights, our civic engagement strategy at, at the Minneapolis Foundation. Just a little bit about, about the podcast and how we started it. Um, and it's, it's a real attempt really to have people better understand our country's past, to provide uh, an educational opportunity or a way for people to get connected to the issues in different ways, and to talk about uh, things that we have not typically talked about or had space for. And so it's been um, quite a delight uh, to lead this effort uh, that the, the board and uh, the leadership at the foundation has um, allowed for me to, to move into podcasting and, and talking about the grittier topics, um, especially racism and structural issues that um, often don't get talked about in a cross-cultural way. And um, we're hoping that we can at least ignite uh, some action, some new thinking, and some different decision making that uh, hopefully can uh, repair some of the wrongs that have been done. Well, I hope so too. I do hope that um, this current crisis passes and that I can come to Minneapolis sometime. But in the meantime, we'll have to communicate by phone and email. <laughs> and, uh, we can accomplish a lot that way. Yes, I appreciate it. Before we depart um, our time, which I really appreciate uh, you making um, this time commitment, but I heard you mentioned a new book. Do you have a timeline for that? Or do you want to share what might be next for you? Well, um, obviously, you know, I'm uh, being locked in my home for the next <laughs> few months. I'll have more time to work on the book than I thought I would. But I don't have a timeline. Um, I, when it's done, it's done. You know, I'm working as a uh, as well as I can to try to finish this. Sounds good. And outside of, um, of course, reading uh, The Color of Law, are there any other uh, resources or uh, sites that you would recommend for our listeners if they wanted to um, dive deeper into this? Well, I mentioned some other books. I, I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with them. Yeah. Um, uh, Michelle Alexander's book, Brian Stevenson's book, uh, Matthew Desmond's book. There's a new book that just came out that um, I think very highly of. It's based on, it's focused on California, but uh, it's worth reading even in Minneapolis and elsewhere in the country because the problems it describes are uh, more advanced in California, but they're coming your way. And uh, the book is called Golden Gates. It's by Connor Dougherty, D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y. And it's uh, the book I've most recently read that um, uh, I think is most appropriate for thinking hard about how to address some of these problems. Perfect. I thank you so much. 
To listen to more episodes and learn more about upcoming events, please visit conversationswithshonda.org. You can also follow Shonda on Twitter at Shonda S. Baker. This is Sue Pak Keenitz from the Minneapolis Foundation. Thank you for listening to Conversations with Shonda.